afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Making It Work, Now Hiring. I'm Courtney Spencer, Vice President of Advertising for the Portland Press Herald. Today, our Business Projects Editor, Carol Coltis, will be moderating the panel discussion on seasonal hiring in the hospitality industry as we progress into tourist season and the world begins to open back up. Before we begin, however, I'd like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for their support of our program. Thank you to Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, Memic, Cross Insurance, and Katahdin Trust Company. Two other quick announcements from some of our partners. The Institute for Family Owned Business is currently accepting nominations for the 2021 Maine Family Business Awards. So if you know a family owned business worthy of recognition, please nominate them at fambusiness.org. Also, the Maine Development Foundation is currently accepting applications for two of their leadership development programs, Leadership Maine and ICL, the Institute for Civic Leadership. You can learn more about these amazing programs at mdf.org. And now I send it over to you, Carol. Thank you, Courtney, I appreciate it. Uh, welcome, at, oh, am I, am I, yes, you are, okay. Um, you always have to wonder, am I muted or not? And I think I'm unmuted. So welcome everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, it seems like the hospitality industry has sort of been knocked for a loop for much of the last, I'd say six or seven years. Um, it's a $6 billion industry here in the state of Maine. And yet we continue to have perennial problems with workforce. So maybe about six years ago, there was a lot of uh, concern about the uh, the increase in minimum wage was $7.50. It went up to $9 an hour. And then there were four years of successive increases. And that caused a lot of concern among hospitality um, industry, particularly the smaller operators who maybe didn't have the resources uh, to handle those kinds of payroll changes, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in a short, relatively short period of time. That was followed by a federal government decision to lower the number of visas that would be available for seasonal workers. And that had a pretty profound impact on a lot of Maine's uh, hospitality industry. And then we had a crazy uh, tightening of the labor market where statewide the um, unemployment rate was somewhere around 3% and it was 2% in places like Cumberland County and parts of York County, which made hiring for anyone uh, really difficult. And then all of that was, I think, trumped by last year when we had a pandemic, which was the granddaddy of all factors um, that affected the, the hospitality industry as uh, places closed, people were quarantined, there was an imposition of distancing requirements and masking requirements that made the hospitality industry really have to uh, adapt to a whole different way of welcoming guests. Uh, and so here we are now, and by all accounts, uh, Maine's tourism season this year coming into it is just, it's going crazy. Uh, Lots of, of um, inns are reporting either no vacancies or you know, really strong bookings throughout the entire season. The same thing uh, with restaurants that are, that are reopening or, are really being swamped. I think people are tapping into um, just a pent up demand to get out of the house and to go someplace and to socialize with folks as it becomes safer to do so. So unfortunately, while there's great demand, the industry is still struggling with how they can um, maintain the quality of service that they, that they have staked their reputations on when they're having a problem uh, attracting and, and keeping workers. And a contributing factor to all of that is the $300 a week bonus that the federal government is awarding to folks who are laid off and are collecting unemployment that bonus is extending into September, um, which is making it in some cases more difficult to get people to return to the workforce. But one of our panelists has a, has a terrific um, resource for that. If you're, if you're unaware of it, I think you'll really find our, her explanation of this program very beneficial. So 
Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists in just a minute. Um, just a word about format. The panelists and I are going to have a conversation for 35 or 40 minutes. Uh, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you in the audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom bar. And um, uh, Strawberry Mojni, who is our great behind the scenes tech person, will queue the questions up um, when we get to that portion of our discussion today. So let me just briefly introduce our panelists and off we go. Our first panelist is Tina Hewitt Gordon. She is the general manager of the Nonantum Resort down in Kennebunkport. She's held that position for 29 years. So she has vast institutional knowledge and she knows what she's talking about. Um, she's been an active member of the hospitality community serving on various local and state boards and currently sits on the board of directors for the Maine Tourism Association Hospitality Maine, the Kennebunkport Beach Improvement Association, and she's a trustee at the South Congregational Church. She's the past president of the Maine Restaurant Association, past president of the Kennebunk, Kennebunkport, and Arundel Chamber of Commerce, and she remains active in both of those. She's also won numerous awards uh, for her service, uh, most notably the Governor's Award for Excellence in Tourism and the Joel Stevens Community Spirit Award. So welcome, Tina. Also joining us is Catherine Ferentz. She is the Director of Workforce Development for the Maine Tourism Association. She's held that position since August of 2019. And in that role, she has spearheaded the founding of a new tourism focused staffing service for members of MTA called Maine Tourism Staffing Solutions. Uh, she's really passionate about connecting tourism professionals throughout the US with great opportunities here in Maine. So she does a significant amount of recruiting out of state. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from George Washington University and before joining the Maine Tourism Association, which if you're not familiar with that group has about 1600 members. It provides lots of resources. It does, um, it lobbies in Augusta. It really is a great resource for anyone in the hospitality industry. But before joining the Maine Tourism Association, Catherine was a recruiter in central and mid coast Maine. So she knows the lay of the land really well. Welcome to you too, Catherine. And finally, we have Vanessa Santarelli. She's the founder of Your Maine Concierge. So she's an entrepreneur. She founded the first statewide and personalized concierge service for lodging, dining, and activities. Um, her goal is to create memorable experience for visitors and manners alike by customizing their itineraries. Uh, to an individual specific interests and their overall travel goals. Um, so I go to Vanessa to get sort of the pulse of what's going on in the hospi hospitality industry because she has a vast network of chefs and innkeepers and tourism organizations all around the state. Um, so she has to do that in order to deliver the kind of uh, uh, experience that her clients want and um, and she's just she's just really well connected within the industry on a statewide level. So welcome to you too, Vanessa. So let's let's get rolling here. So my first question um, it summarizes a little of my introductory remarks in terms of it seems the hospitality industry has been dogged by workforce challenges for the last several years. And so I'd like each of you please to highlight what you think are the most significant factors affecting the workforce this season and the context for those factors. And, um, and Tina, why don't we begin with you, please? Sure. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for um, listening and um, participating in this uh, event. Um, yes, the hospitality industry has definitely been hit hard. And so what are some of the challenges that we're going to be, that we're dealing with? Well, we're dealing with a workforce um, that is still to some extent scared um, to come back to work. So um, as an employer, we have to be sure that we're very transparent and we're making sure that our, our current employees as well as potential employees understand the lengths that we're gonna go to to keep them safe. Um, as well as the guests that are staying with us to keep them safe. So that's, a, that's one issue. The next issue that, we're, that some employers are dealing with is um, the lack of international workers. So typically in a season, um, we would be receiving about 7,000 H2B and J1 workers. This year, we're gonna be lucky to get a third of those workers. 
So, you know, that put, um, puts a huge challenge on those employers, but what it does to the employers such as the Nonantum who do not hire H2B or J1 visa workers, the pool gets a little bit um, more shallow because everybody's trying to buy for the same, um, the, the, the same employees who are out there. You of course mentioned the extra subsidy um, from the federal government, which definitely is attractive to some people to be able to stay at home um, because there's, there's work challenges. Um, mm -hmm. The dynamics have changed. Their children are still being, um, you know, the, if you have young children, you have to take care of them <laughs> in, in school and they're not back in full time. And so there, I think there's a lot of contributing factors as to why our workforce is so depleted this year. Um, and so as um, a hospitality employer, we are looking at how can we do our business, offer that same high level of service and with less people. We had to turn on a dime last year. We had to reinvent everything we did. And a lot of those practices will continue here in 2021. And we still were, were working really hard at the Nonantum um, just to be able to create a seamless um, mm -hmm. effort um, moving into this coming season. Great. Thank you. And what are you seeing, Catherine? Well, everything that it, Tina mentioned, I absolutely completely agree with. Um, I think that those are all incredibly important factors this year. Uh, just to add a couple more that I think are a contributing thing here. Um, you know, the hospitality industry, unfortunately, had to lay off a lot of people last spring. And many of those people did go back on the job market. And a lot of other industries have been hiring over the past year. And I, I do think that some, especially some of the best people in the industry, have found jobs outside of the industry in the past year. Um, so, you know, it's up to us to either win them back or replace them. So I think backfilling those roles is certainly a part of it. Um, and I think this past year has been really hard on people, um, even people who have been working in the industry. It's been possibly one of the most difficult customer service environments in a generation over the past mm -hmm. year. Um, between people leaving the workforce early because of an early retirement, um, child care issues, elder care issues, of course, safety concerns. And then also uh, those remaining last year, um, a lot of them were experiencing lower tips because fewer people were eating out and also um, people weren't tipping quite as well. There was a Harris poll that came out in October that found that 20% of Americans are tipping less now than they were before COVID across the board. Um, they're frontline workers, so they're having to deal with all of the changes that have been made, um, but both between business decisions and, of course, um, from the state level enforcing mask mandates and all the different things that they've had to do. Um, and then also uh, there have been, I mean, Maine has very fortunately been spared from uh, some of the worst effects of the pandemic, but um, you know, many of Maine's seasonal workers come here from other parts of the country, which have been very hard hit. Um, over 600,000 people are unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, and there have been some studies uh, out in California, for example, that found that line cooks were the most high risk industry in the first seven months of the pandemic with a higher really? mortality rate, even than healthcare workers. So I think those are all contributing factors that have just made this past year very hard, which has all contributed to burnout. Um, and so, um, you know, that I think that there is some low uh, energy in some sectors of the market because of that difficulty. And then with low staff that are currently working there because if people are understaffed, that puts even more pressure on current employees. So I think that those are all factors as well. Right, right. Vanessa, can you add anything to that? What are you, are, are there other factors that you're seeing from your vantage point? Yeah, thank you so much again for including me on this panel. Um, yeah, I mean, I would echo everything that Tina and Catherine said for sure. Um, and I think that workforce housing is just one other um, serious consideration that um, is really problematic. I know a lot of friends of mine who have worked in, um, you know, the, the restaurant and uh, in sector for decades and um, were in situations where they were renting, you know, from someone and that person decided to sell their property because um, you know property values have gone up so much, and so they were left in a situation where um, you know they just don't have any housing close to where any affordable housing or any housing at all that's anywhere close to where 
they work and uh, couple that with the fact that if they're a single parent or if they're parents, um, the child care issue is also one that's um, really problematic. I had one friend who was in Camden who was renting this great spot that was within like 10 miles from her workplace, um, but the person who owns it decided to turn their property into an Airbnb. And so they can make more money as an Airbnb. And so she unfortunately um, had like less than a month to find um, new housing. Um, so I think that that's certainly a challenge for um, lots of workers around the state. And I think that there are some geographic disparities um, and differences. So like some of the folks that own restaurants that I know that are along the New Hampshire border, um, you know, when they had to lay off staff or um, cut back their staff, some of those folks ended up getting jobs, um, you know, in other sectors, as Catherine mentioned, but on the other side of the border. Um, and so now that they're reopening and, you know, getting back up to full staffing, they're finding it challenging, even though folks might want to come back, they might have a job that's, you know, they've got some seniority and they, they're getting paid um, higher wages. And so, yeah, I think that those are all um, definite considerations and, and challenges that folks are facing. Um, and, and the workforce shortage, um, and I will say, I mean, you know, like I, I know one restaurant owner, he owns a restaurant, he and his wife own a restaurant on Western Maine, but they also own one on Mount Desert Island they're actually considering um, renting tents and having their employees, you know, stay in tents for this season, just because there is no housing at all anywhere remotely close to Bar Harbor or Southwest Harbor, or Northeast Harbor. I mean, I've never heard of that situation. Usually there's, you know, they've had no problem um, getting, you know, housing for their workers. And so the fact that they're renting campsites is, is shocking. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, so that's, I guess that's a strategy, right? <laughs> if if you, you've got a problem, that's one way you can solve it. Um, but what are, what are you seeing in terms of, um, what are some hospitality managers doing to address those concerns? Like what are the, what are the strategies that maybe we could share that would help um, other people? And, and Catherine, I'll, I'll toss that question to you first. Okay, sure. Um, so, I mean, I think, the first thing to do is, in, if, if it were me, of course, is if uh, to look internally at your positions and make sure that they're competitive. Um, so I think it's worth doing a compensation analysis just to see if other people around you have raised wages. A lot of people have raised wages this year um, compared to last year. So I think it's worth doing. Um, and also not just looking at other hospitality businesses, but other entry level businesses in your area in other industries that are hiring and just seeing, you know, maybe what how competitive that is. Um, and then also, uh, I think it's really important, you know, to remember it's a job seekers market. So to treat job seekers like customers, um, you know, their compensation and benefits, but also um, <clears throat> Job seekers are looking for company culture, growth opportunities, so really highlighting that for people like, yes, you'll start here, but here's where we're going to go with it, and there's going to be growth, and this can be a career for you, really highlighting those things. Um, also, I think advertising in as many places as humanly possible is really important, um, and also putting up as much information as possible, so making sure you have a job board on your company website, like on your page somewhere where people can find jobs, and list the compensation and list the benefits and get as specific as you can with the hours and, and those kinds of things. Workers are experiencing a lot of difficulty with childcare. So if they can have an idea, I mean, obviously there will be variation, obviously, but you know, it, this is a morning shift, this is an evening shift, like those kinds of things are super important. And you really just wanna tell the story of your place, of your, of your establishment and really kind of think of it as selling and sell it to job seekers the same way you would sell to customers. Um, but also I feel like this year posting positions and just waiting for applicants isn't really enough. Um, so you kind of have to go to the applicant and meet them where they are. A few ways you can do that are via resume databases. Uh, there are free ones like on the main job link website, which is the unemployment website. You can actually go there, search, I'm looking for cooks in a gunquit, and then it will pop up resumes and you can actually reach out to those people. Um, there are also paid ones. Uh, Indeed has a resume database. Career Builder has a resume database. If you just type in resume database in a Google search, you'll come up with a dozen different websites. 
Um, you can also partner with nonprofits in Maine that do outreach for job seekers. There are several. Um, a couple of them are FedCap Rehabilitation Services, Goodwill Industries, and Catholic Charities. Uh, these are people who work with communities where people are looking for jobs. You can send them your job descriptions. They will post them to their job seekers, and that's a way to get, get the word out. Um, Catholic Charities works with refugee groups. Uh, FedCap works with people who are on, on unemployment, who are facing challenges with child care, with um, also with uh, potentially criminal histories, that kind of thing. But they do resume building workshops, those kinds of things. And then Goodwill Industries also does training groups where they train people how to do positions and then place them. Um, move quickly. People are getting multiple offers. Uh, I do a lot of recruiting and I'll talk to some, I'll get a resume that morning, talk to them that evening. They've somehow gotten a job in between those two things. So just moving very rapidly right now, I think is really important. Um, also wanted to mention WorkShare, which is the thing that you had brought up uh, before. This is a Department of Labor program. Um, it is designed for employees who are on unemployment. Um, if they go back to work part-time for a business and they are getting and they're making uh, their earnings per week are less than are, are equal to uh, their weekly employment benefit plus five dollars so if they were getting um, two hundred dollars from unemployment and they're making less than two hundred and five dollars at the job then they are still eligible for unemployment benefits and that three hundred dollar federal um, subsidy so that the federal unemployment. So that can be a way if you have, especially if you have employees who are maybe uh, hesitant about coming back because they don't want to give up that $300 benefit, that can get, be a great way to get people back on the job. They can make on average about $100 more um, working than not if they come back um, on a part-time basis. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor actually just gave the Maine Department of Labor a $382,000 grant to promote this program and also to subsidize it. So this is a program that's going to be quite well funded this year. Um, I am not with the Department of Labor, but uh, if you want to enroll, I can give you the phone number to call. Um, and I can maybe type this in the chat, but it's 207-623-6783. You leave a message with their name, business number, and phone number, and they will call you back to help you enroll in the process. And there's no cap in that program right now, Catherine, in terms of the number of people who can participate? There are, is not, and I know that they have quite a bit of, um, of openings right now. Uh, they're just now rolling out, trying to promote the program. I believe there's only 90 employers enrolled right now, so there's definitely... Oh, wow. Yeah, there, there's definitely room. Wow. That, well, that's all really good information. Thank you. And for just a, a uh, just a message to our a mention to our uh, viewers, all of this information will be available on our landing page after this event. We record our uh, making it work sessions, and we put those and all the links that our panelists make reference to on the landing page. So if you stepped away from your computer for a few minutes, don't panic. You can get all this information uh, probably available tomorrow, a little a little bit after the fact. Um, so thank you. And, and, and Tino, what about what strategies are you seeing either that you're employing at the Nonantum or that some of your colleagues are, are using? Well, I agree with, um, and thank you, Catherine, for laying out all those different options so clearly for everyone, because I can say that here at the Nonantum, our HR team um, is in, definitely involved in each one of those um, initiatives. Um, so that's, you know, going out seeking employees, but um, we're open right now and we're experiencing all time um, high occupancy levels and guests coming in. So what are we going to do right now until we can actually hire those people? So internally, one, a couple of the things that we're doing is cross training, cross training, cross training. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, um, my housekeeping crew is incredibly um, slim right now. I should have 20 to 25 housekeeping employees with my executive housekeeper and assistant. I have 12. Um, so we're really, really shorthanded. We are not offering daily housekeeping service. We're only servicing the rooms after they've stayed for three days or obviously when they check out. Um, but I have a whole breakfast crew. So now when they're done with breakfast, they, um, been, they clock out as a server, they go and they clock in as housekeeping and housekeeping has broken jobs up into different, um, different skills. So you, they can go up and help make beds. They can tear out rooms, you know, strip out the rooms from the dirty things. They can, they can vacuum the hallways. So we've, we've taken the individual departments and the individual 
um, jobs, broken them down even farther so that we can offer even more flexibility. I mean, we're, we're a, a, a business that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so we take and spread things out. My night auditor in the middle of the night, when he's done running audit, he helps put together these sugar packets and things for the housekeeping crew. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just a matter of being, being um, smart or you know, looking at things differently and saying, you know, how can we make um, our current employees' jobs that much easier? Um, by lending hands, um, you know, even our management team goes in and helps clean rooms um, when we have a few hours here and there. So I think it's a matter of being creative until we can get the people that can come into work. I mean, we offer sign-on bonuses, we offer referral bonuses, so because, you know, we have good people who work for us and good people have good friends. And so we're hoping they're going to bring their friends in. But until the until you know some some more people come through the doors, we're just going to continue to be creative and stay upbeat and positive. Right. It'll be interesting to see how that affects your company culture, Tina. When with all this cross training and people who maybe weren't used to working with other folks or doing different skills, um, you know, what kinds of opportunities that might present going forward. Well, we started, you know, um, the pandemic really amplified um, our cross training program, but we had started this even back in 2019. So um, move forward into 2020, some of our silver linings were perfecting that cross training and now move into 2021. And we kind of got it down to a science so that um, each one of each cog on the wheel can um, turn a little bit more gently, if you will. Oh, that's great. Vanessa, what are you seeing from your wide network of, uh, of uh, contacts and, and colleagues? Sure, so um, the resources that Catherine um, and Tina laid out are, are wonderful. Um, I would just add to that, I don't know if um, folks on, the, on today's um, discussion are familiar with the Chefs of Maine website, but that's also a free resource for um, restaurant owners, brewery owners, cheese makers, um, uh, pastry chefs, there's, there's, it's a mostly in sort of the food and um, distillery and sort of beverage um, universe, but those, uh, they not only allow folks to post information about their respective businesses, but also put job postings on there, post events that they might be having so that, you know, people can sign up through that portal. So that's another resource um, and it's at no cost to people who want to sign up. Um, I'd also say, and I'm sure that this comes as no surprise to folks that are on the discussion today, but um, there are a lot of like um, inns that, you know, obviously during peak season in previous years and say July and August would have two or three night minimum stays. Um, some properties I know have even expanded that to do four and five to six night minimum stays, depending on the accommodations and they're getting those bookings. Um, I know that um, there's a, for example, a small inn um, that I work with um, in Deer Isle, they have cottages on the property, then also they have guest rooms. And so the cottages they're doing at, I think four and five night minimum stays and the rooms I think are at two night minimum stays because as they were, uh, as Tina was just mentioning with respect to housekeeping, you know, I mean, a lot of these properties don't have the staff that can turn over rooms and cottages in the same way and to the same degree that they did before. So that's um, a strategy that I've seen um, getting employed more and more around the state for um, overnight accommodations. And then for restaurant, uh, a lot of restaurants now are trying some creative ways to, um, to avoid the risk of like wasting ingredients. So um, they might be doing like prefix um, dinner reservations um, for a week at a time or a month at a time. So um, you know, announcing, okay, reservations, you know, are open for our prefix um, dinners for the month of June. Um, but then they also have some reservations for say, um, walk-ins or um, bar seats um, and trying to sort of maximize the number of um, knowing in advance how full their restaurant would be so that they can plan on uh, provisioning and doing those sorts of things. And I'm seeing that more and more um, for restaurants to do prefix and um, reservation only in some cases too. So those are some of the other things. I know some um, restaurants are also 
continuing their takeout, despite the fact that they'll be doing um, dine-in um, services now. And there are also some um, catering companies that I know caterers and chefs that are fully booked already into 2022, um, but like, let's just, uh, Trilly, for example, out of Belfast. So they do a little bit more of like an enhanced um, uh, meal prep service. So what some people might be familiar with, like plated or um, uh, the, some of the larger corporate ones that you'll see on TV, they've actually come up with this amazing um, uh, prep service that is almost like the meals that they serve are, it only takes about 30 minutes to heat and um, serve, but they're really like you're eating in a restaurant. It's really fine foods. And they've actually been reaching out to some um, properties that may have had restaurants before, but they don't have chefs and servers and that they can still offer guests like meals, um, but they're just, you know, done in a different way to try to be flexible and creative like Tina was just talking about. Um, and that service is one that, um, you know, they do home deliveries in the mid coast, you place orders Saturdays and Sundays for a Thursday delivery, but the food is so fresh because it's sourced from local farms and, and everything that you could actually um, prepare those foods for a week. So I know that they're reaching out to other vacation rental companies and smaller inns to give them the option of um, having foods that are restaurant quality at those properties. Oh, that's really interesting. It sounds like it sounds like a lot of people are being very innovative, trying to to you know maintain quality and um, and yet serve their customers in the kind of with a backdrop of really in increasing demand for those for those services. One of the questions we got uh, from someone who registered for this uh, at the time that that the person registered was, if you can give a sense of. What are competitive wages? I know that 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 depends on what part of the state you're in, and you know how upscale you're trying to what you're shooting for in terms of accommodations or in terms of a restaurant. But if if um, if you could just sort of spitball, what are some of the typical wage? What's the wage range you might see um, with respect to like a housekeeping position or a server position? Um, or, you know, uh, general maintenance or landscaping. I'm, I'm just curious if, 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 uh, if you guys would be willing to just sort of roughly estimate that. I'll jump in there. Um, you know, minimum wage in the state of Maine is $12.15 per hour right now. Um, and currently a, a starting housekeeper, for, we do things a little bit differently because we include a built-in gratuity for our housekeeping. Um, staff, which equates to about $4 per adult per night. Mm -hmm. And so we'll start out our housekeeping crew anywhere between 14 to 15, 15 hour, depending on um, their range of experience. But at the end of the week, when we look at what those gratuities mean, that housekeeper who was hired at that wage is closer to $20 an hour. Wow. So, um, and the same thing with servers. Um, I know Catherine said that um, tipped employees were down last year. We actually saw the reverse of that. Our tipped employees made more money last year. Um, mm -hmm. And we're seeing that again right now um, because people seem, in our experience anyway, we're in Southern Maine, um, seem to be um, a bit more generous in how they're um, tipping the employees. Mm -hmm. And what about, um, what about in the restaurant industry, like a, a line chef or a, a, a sous chef or a, a line cook? Are, are those are, are those folks' earnings? Have they been going up? Um, yes. In the, okay. Yes, absolutely. Whereas you know, when I, I remember you know years ago when um, minimum wage went up um, to I don't know it was like eight dollars an hour or something, um, and it was again you know the employees market we were having to pay ten twelve dollars for dish, dishwashers and we thought oh my god how are we going to ever do this, um, but wages now in twenty twenty one for a line cook is you know starting at fifteen dollars an hour and going up from there. Um, as far as other positions, you're going to see that throughout. And here, you know, here in Kenny Bunkport, I look at some of the other properties. And um, as Catherine said, don't just look at what entry level positions are paying for in hospitality. I'm looking at the retail sector here as well. Um, and everybody is hitting that 15 to um, $18 an hour mark um, to bring people in. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. 
Oh, I, I just, I, that sounds about right to me. I, I think that the wages, uh, you certainly have to look at how much cost of living has gone up in the past year, in, especially in Southern Maine. So I feel like the wage pressure in Southern Maine is particularly high because a one bedroom apartment in South Portland now is $1,500. <laughs> so I mean, like it, it's just the amount of money that a person needs to make in order to live has gone up. So, so keeping that in mind, it, just think about how much the cost of living has raised in your area. And that can give you a good idea of just how much wage pressure there is. And uh, so, sort of the what the expectation then is that um, that hospitality managers are going to have to try to recapture some of that by increasing their prices to the consumer, right? Room rates are going up, the cost of meals going up. It, it, is that, would you say that's accurate? Yes. Yeah. But uh, as my controller says, um, it's not what you make, it's what you spend. And so I think, you know, you're also seeing, um, you know, to Vanessa's point, um, everyone is really looking at how are they, how their operations are um, working and the different items that we're spending. Because everything's more expensive now too. Right. Um, so it, it, we're very, very con conscientious about money. Certain things like we always had, we buy these um, cups for our uh, pool bar that are environmentally friendly, biodegradable, and we always have our logo put on them. Well, the prices of plastic, as everybody probably realizes, has gone through the roof. And so we made the decision to, you know what, I guess we don't really need to have the logo on those cups anymore, but it saved us $4,000. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, spread that across, you know, the property, spread that across the restaurant. And those are the decisions that I think people are looking um, to make, mm -hmm. to be able to offset it. Because at some point you can't really charge $20, $25 for a hamburger. You got to cut costs somewhere. Right. So, yeah, I had a conversation with Sean Riley. He's the CEO of Main Course Hospitality. Um, and that's a company that oversees about 22 um, hotels that I, I think they're uh, Marriott's and, and Hilton's. And he said, one of the decisions they made was for breakfast, their buffet used to offer like 70 different options mm -hmm. and realizing you don't really need to have 70 different options. And they've scaled that down and are likely to continue with a very scaled down menu because uh, it just makes sense in, in terms of the cost related to that, the safety of offering fewer um, options for the servers and for the guests. And so, <coughs> excuse me, I think a lot of, whether you're very small or you're very big, you're looking at ways that you can be smarter about containing costs, but still being able to deliver a, a quality experience. So. Some of the strategies that, that we were just discussing now are sort of like, well, some are long-term, um, but some also I think are in the short-term just to try to get through this season. And I'm wondering if you're seeing any longer-term strategies that maybe would have the, um, would have the ability to, to really impact um, stability within the hospitality industry uh, with respect to workforce. Um, I, I, I'm never, I'm never sure what the role the state has in this kind of thing. But are there initiatives that you see coming from the state, or are there? Um, I, I know that there are some educational initiatives that the Hospitality Maine Education Foundation is undertaking. Um, and I wonder if, if uh, you could, if any of you could, could speak to what you see as longer-term solutions in, in the offing. Yes, I'd, well, I'd like to speak to that if you don't mind. Um, <laughs> being on the hospitality main board, I'm yes. um, very passionate about this because I do believe that workforce development is the number one issue um, that our state and our industry has to deal with. Um, in hospitality main, our, the um, Education Foundation has launched an initiative um, called the Great Main Comeback. And this is all about workforce development. And these are definitely, this is a long-term thing. We're planting the seeds to be able to um, grow new employees, if you will. And so there's a program um, that our innkeeper, Jean Gin Marvin um, began, it's called um, Earn and Learn. And it's um, right year, and right now in its first um, pilot program year with York County Community College, that's targeting junior and, um, high, junior and seniors in high school that can come and work in a property um, from May until October. And then from October till May, um, they can go to school 100% paid for, unless they make over $150,000. But I think we can pretty much say that you know, they're, they're okay, to, the, the school would be free um, and they can do it virtually. 
And then after two years, um, they'll have a degree in hospitality and they can seamlessly transfer to Husson, Thomas, and um, USM, I believe, but don't quote me on that. Um, I, I think I sent you over the link to the Great Maine Comeback um, that you could share with everybody. And so what this is, is doing is saying, you know what, the hospitality industry is a great industry to work in. We're flexible, it's fun. Um, I mean, jobs are paying more than they ever have. Come join this industry because it's a great industry to be a part of. And I think that's the messaging that we need to be sending um, to um, potential employees because yes, right now we're in a crunch but the crunch is only gonna get tighter as we move down um, through the years. Mm -hmm. And I, I, yeah, and I would just add, I mean, I think um, what individual, uh, just by way of example, chefs and restaurant owners are doing to mentor um, some of the entry level staff and to really, um, like I know Tina was talking about cross training employees at the Nonantum, um, you know, Chef Melissa Kelly, for example, at Primo Restaurant, I mean, you know, her program over there really sort of it's not just, oh, it's a job. It's really meant to be a career and a learning opportunity. So from the farmers who work on the farm, I know the current head farmer had started in, a, in another position as a farm hand or um, as one of the lower level farmers and now is running the farm over there to the chefs that, um, you know, she has a pasta station, she has a pastry um, kitchen, she has, you know, the cold station and the sauce, you know, and the grill. So. Um, people are cross-trained and they're really, I think, encouraged to sort of rise through the ranks at restaurants like that. Um, so I think that individual, um, and whether it's, you know, bakeries or cheese making operations or butchers, um, fishermen and oyster farmers, what Maine Oyster Company is doing, they're actually setting up a, um, a research facility at their base camp over in Phippsburg. So people are going to actually be signing up to come on property and learn how to become oyster farmers. I mean, wow. from uh, from the, you know, sort of starting the seedlings or I can't remember, the spat or whatever you call them, <laughs> all the way up through the process. But I mean, that aquaculture is a huge industry now, um, uh, both in oyster farming and the kelp and um, seaweed industry. So there's a lot of really innovative, exciting things going on and people really, training on the job and, you know, people in these positions, farmers and everything else, really teaching, um, you know, the folks that come and work for them, you know, how to become really an integral part of their teams. And so I think that really has a lot to do with retention, job retention, and then fostering the next generation of leaders in Maine's food and hospitality world, for sure. Mm, great. And I get to, what, about, what about, oh, go ahead, Tina. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, I get to talk to a lot of high school students um, in some of their um, career development. And when I talk to them about all the different positions that um, exist in the hospitality industry, and of course I'll focus on um, the Nonantum or any hotel, it's like a little city. Um, and they don't realize how many different positions are available within this little city. So it might not just be checking somebody in at the front desk or being a bartender, um, or, you know, being a bellman, but they, you know, you have maintenance and you have landscaping and you've got payroll, you've got HR, you've got marketing and sales and social media, and the list goes on and on. So again, I think, you know, getting our message out, our industry message out um, is first and foremost to attract um, new employees. And Catherine, do you have something to add to in terms of uh, longer term strategies that will pay off down the road? Um, I... So, I mean, I think that this is a, a larger conversation. It's certainly not something that any individual property or person could really right. necessarily affect. But if you look at turnover in the industry, and it is unfortunately fairly high compared to some other, especially in the restaurant industry, you know, why do people leave? And for, for uh, you know, a number of them, you know, for every person who falls in love with the industry and they love it and they, they want to stay and they, they, they just fall in love with it, there's a person who's like, well, I'm looking for more stability. I'm looking for benefits. I'm looking for paid time off. I'm looking for vacation. I'm look and so I think that, um, that that's sort of an inherent weakness maybe in what currently a lot of people in the industry offer. Certainly you get those benefits when you get to that higher level management, but to work your way up to that 
other industries don't have that same barrier to that to that kind of stable schedules benefits company so i think that that's a larger conversation that the industry is going to have and I, and i think that feeds into larger conversations that the country is having um and i think if we could maybe find some solutions to some of those questions that that would that would be of great benefit to the industry just one quick question before we we go to um, the questions that are uh, that are in the queue, and that is the state recently um, changed its unemployment requirements and reinstated the requirement that you have to show proof that you're looking for work. And I wonder, I wonder, do you think that's going to have any impact on um, on people uh, on hiring within the hospitality industry? Is that going to be an, a nudge, or is that no? Nope. Tina's shaking her head. Nope. No, I don't they still so. sign up for, um, you know, my HR director will tell you um, she gets the inquiries and they sign up um, to, for an appointment and they just never show, they never show up. They don't, you know, they, they don't answer the call. They don't return the call. So although I applaud the efforts because I think it really is an important thing that people um, do look, I don't think it's going to um, move the needle at all. Okay. Yeah, I don't. It is there something else that could be coming from um, from the state that would be helpful right now? Just, I mean, I think the work share program is helpful. I think yep. that will exactly. definitely help people, uh, encourage people more. Um, you know, you you catch more uh, flies with honey, as they say. Uh -huh. so I think that that I think that program is is something coming from the state that will be quite beneficial. Good. Um, okay, well, I think we're at that time. So, Strawberry, could you queue up the first question, please? Yes. Uh, this is not a crisis unique to hospitality. A gas station near me is offering a $200 sign-on bonus. How can businesses survive when there is so much financial competition to even get an employee's attention? Good question. <laughs> well, that is a good question. I mean, here in Kenny Bunk, the, um, the local Domino's um, delivery um, is offering an $850 sign on bonus. Wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, it's tough. It's I mean, really. I, I do think that sign on bonuses get attention, certainly, but I don't think that they have the lasting power. Right. Like, you might be better served taking that. $800 signing bonus and then adding it to the wage in the starting wage. I, I think that that speaks more because it's something that people can count on. It's not just this one time infusion of cash in my opinion. And I think, yeah, and I think yeah, promoting the other aspects of why someone would want to join, you know, your team um, is, you know, whether, you know, maybe not everybody can offer a sign on bonus or, you know, certain benefits, but maybe there are other aspects of joining someone's team that are um, that puts you at a competitive advantage and I think different places have different benefits um, you know some businesses like you know have cross uh, benefits sort of across um, to extend to each other so like if you're a um, if you're an employee at a particular golf course, for example, you might be able to have playing privileges at a golf course that's, you know, close and partners with them. I mean, there are, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that that's the be all end all, but having, I, I think that the quality, the life and work quality balance is obviously on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, Carol, as you and I were talking, I mean, some of my friends uh, that own, uh, one of the best restaurants up here in the uh, Penn Bay area decided, look, you know, if anything, this pandemic taught us that spending quality time with our children and our families was just as important as making, you know, sure we, you know, make enough money during the season. And so they've decided to have uh, only uh, be open five days a week until mid June and then go up to six for the very, very peak season, but go back to just five. Whereas previously almost year round they were open like six days a, a week and they're just so I think that there's um there are quality of life benefits that may be appealing to people when considering where they want to work now as opposed to just wages just benefits just those sorts of things I mean obviously earning a, a livable wage and things like that are obviously very very important but I also think the quality of life and the work-life balance things, flexible work schedules if possible. And I know that's becoming more challenging. Um, those sorts of things I think make a big difference. 
I, I totally, absolutely 100% agree with you, Vanessa. I mean, obviously um, people come to work because they need to get paid and we want to make sure that we're paying them well. But, you know, at the Nonantum, we won the best places to work five years running. And that's not something that somebody decided. That's um, something that our employees voted us to be able to receive. And it's because of the culture that we, that we have here and the way we treat our employees because they can go anywhere to get a job, they can get anywhere to get paid, but why do they wanna work at your property? You know, why do they wanna work at the Nonantum? Why do they wanna work at, at your property? It's because they wanna feel valued and they wanna know that what matters most is them. I mean, here at the hotel, their families come first and as long as their families are taken care of, we know when they get here, they're gonna be their best selves and they'll be able to take care of our guests. And so we're very transparent in that and all that we do and all of our messaging. And I just think that, you know, people listening on the call should really think about what their business is, is offering to their employees um, outside of work. And I'm, I'm just curious for, for like smaller operators who maybe don't have um, as many resources as bigger ones, does the Maine Tourism Association or does Hospitality Maine, is there is there a resource they can go to to help them craft that message or to get um, to be able to market themselves in a way that speaks to what Vanessa, you and, and Tina were just speaking about in terms of, you know, it, it's really tough out there. It's really competitive to get people to want to come work for you. You have to you have to present yourself in the best light possible. So I'm just curious, are there resources out there that will help people do that? I don't, um, I'll, I'll have, as defer to Catherine about Maine tourism. Um, and as far as hospitality Maine, um, I would again, probably defer to, to their expert, but what, one of the things that I would recommend to people is look, look at your local chamber of commerces. Mm -hmm. um, our local chamber is very supportive of all the businesses and are focused in on their smaller individual needs. And I think are able to offer up some um, different level of support not only in staffing, but just in some messaging. Um, for instance, you know, earlier on you had um, made a comment about um, people coming in and being demanding and being that you know, forward facing person having to enforce mask wearing and everything else. Well, the current thing that we're all dealing with is staffing shortages. And so staffing shortages tends to sometimes means a little bit longer wait times, et cetera. And our local chamber just came out with three different um, PSA announcements um, highlighting exactly that issue saying, wow. please be patient. Um, we're trying our best, um, you know, and different messaging. So I think, you know, using um, some of those entities as a resource is something to consider. Good. At, at the Maine Tourism Association, that's a huge part of my job. So if anybody wants to uh, talk <laughs> about their messaging or their, their, their recruiting or, or anything like that, I am certainly available to speak to anyone. Um, our program here at MTA is all about uh, recruiting people both from out of state and within state and helping businesses uh, hire people. I write job descriptions for people, kind of take, take their list of things and then help them craft a compelling message and a job description. So I'm more than happy to talk to anyone who would be interested in kind of going over their specific needs and messaging and that kind of thing. Cool, great. Well, why don't we take the next question, Strawberry? Uh, another follow-up question about sign-on bonuses. Do you have a period of time the person is required to work in order to be eligible for that bonus? Well, sign-on bon bonuses do require that, right? You get a, a sign-on, you get a certain amount of money, and then you get another you know, slug of money six months later, and then on the one-year anniversary. That, that's my understanding in other industries. Is that what you guys see too? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah. We, we do a, um, a 30 day after 30 days, they get okay. money. And then um, at the Ooh. end of the season or the end of what would be their natural season. So if it was a college kid, it would be the middle of August. Or if it was somebody who planned to stay, it would be the middle of December. They get another kick at the end of our season. Good. Okay. Something else you might consider in addition to a sign on bonus um, as a, as a recruiting tool up front is employee referral bonuses. So, you know, maybe the employee who refers, if the person works a certain number of days, they get money. And then also the person who signs on gets money and it can be about the same amount. That way everybody wins. That might be another way. Cause if your employees are referring them, they're probably, they're at least somewhat vetted. Right. Right. That works. Yep. It does How work. about the, the next question, Strawberry? 
Uh, we hear from many people who just can't find affordable quality childcare in order to accommodate their work schedules. Do you have examples of employers getting creative in offering childcare? It's a huge concern. I'm afraid I don't have any examples of anybody doing that, but if someone was able to do that, I think it would be an incredible bone of benefit to, to potential employees. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that. We've um, allowed our staff to bring um, children to work if they need to, especially during, you know, 2020. Um, we turned a couple of our um, meeting smaller rooms that weren't being used so the kids could bring their computer and go to school. Um, but again, what I would say in the hospitality industry is to flex the flexibility um, line and let people know that, you know, again, we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so if you're not able to have child care from X time to this time, well, we do have positions available that could, we can work around your schedule. Mm -hmm. That's good too. Next question, Strawberry. Uh, WorkShare would only allow a $15 an hour employee to work 13 hours and still get their unemployment. Those of you who are using this, do you have a lot of workers who are taking advantage of this and how challenging is that to manage? Kind of a follow up to that, how do your 30 and 40 hour a week workers feel about others who are only working 10 to 13 hours and maybe earning just as much as those people working full time? Hmm. We employed this tactic last year. And um, what I would say to you is that um, the people who were working the 30, 40, 50 hours a week were really, really happy that there were people that came in as relief hitters for 13 mm. hours um, to be able to, to do that. So, I mean, I realize we're now into 2021, um, but again, with the demand for business and the, the burden on our full-time sort of core group. Um, it's welcome to have new people coming in because it's only until the middle of September. And I mean, although that right now seems like it's forever um, down the road, it's really just going to be a blip in, the, in, in a moment of time. And then once that $300 is gone, um, we'll be able to have them here on a full-time basis. So I, I think that it's how you spin it too, um, to your other employees um, and as well as the people who are coming in that are on unemployment, they're doing this because that's what they have to do for their lives. Um, and we're just fortunate that they're going to be able to come in and give us a hand. Completely agreed. I, uh, I have one person I'm working with pretty closely right now who's doing work share um, and she's using it for basically all of her employees. So, right. and just kind of cobbling together part-time benefits. So that, that has taken care of that that part of people feeling maybe some jealousy. I would say that if you make it very clear to your full-time employees that there are growth opportunities and there are benefits and there are rewards for their hard work, that that, that really helps. Usually those part-time people are, like, like Tina said, relief hitters. They're not necessarily your core people. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I think oh, part of that, I'm sorry, part of that question was um, how is that to manage? When we, when we employed that tactic last year, um, it, it wasn't that difficult. It was just like um, managing um, a part-time employee. Well, that's good. So, so people will, if they aren't familiar with that program, I think all of this information has been, has been helpful. I have one really quick question uh, before we wrap up here. And that is, um, Tina, you mentioned the, the loss of those uh, visa, those seasonal visa jobs. Do, have you have any of you heard anything about um, I know that they lifted the cap this year, but they did it too late to have any impact for this summer. Mm -hmm. Do you have does anyone have a sense of whether that cap will will be removed or if those numbers will be restored to Oh, I forget pre pre Trump administration, I forget when they when they started to, to lower those numbers. I, I'm just, I'm just curious. I know that a lot of a lot of for, for businesses that were using that resource, they had a very well honed network. They had people who returned year after year after year. And I think there was a cost, it was around $2,000 per employee to go through that whole visa process. Um, I'm just curious if, if you think that will ever be restored to the resource it, it once was. Well, 
as Catherine said, I think this is probably a greater conversation than what we right. have time for. Right. Um, but I do know that um, on the national level, um, you know, our representatives in Congress are very well aware um, of our issues and they're working very hard on our behalf um, in order to be able to get us um, the workers that we need. Good. I know that this year in particular, there's the issue of embassies overseas being closed. And so people can't get the interview that they need to come here. Right. And, that is, that, and that's a specific 2021 issue that should be resolved by next year. So that should help uh, going forward. As far as the cap goes, I certainly hope they lift it. It, it needs to be much larger than it currently is. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, it looks like we got through all the questions in the queue and we got through the questions that had been submitted ahead of time. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of you for sharing your expertise with us today. If we were doing these uh, B2B forums in our old space in the Portland Public Library, there would be thunderous applause right now, um, <laughs> recognizing your insight and, and your advice that all three of you were willing to share with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, thank you to our sponsor. Thanks, Strawberry, our sponsors, and thank you, Strawberry, for, for managing these uh, Zoom calls with the flair that you do. And, um, and, and for all of you out there, all of you in the audience, please go to pressherald.com uh, forward slash events where you'll find this landing page. The recording of this um, conversation will be there as well as all the links and the resources that our panelists have shared. So uh, thank you again to everyone and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.